switch over to my bio. So good evening, everyone. Um, with us tonight is Mike Connor. He's a certified International Society of Arboriculture uh, arborist, uh, a Michigan nursery grower, and a 50 uh, plus year beekeeper. He uniquely understands the relationships between plants, trees, and pollinators. He's a graduate of Cornerstone University with postgraduate studies at Calvin College and Michigan State University. Mikey became a branch manager of, of Dayton and Sons, uh, the Michigan branch office in 1977. There he received a real education in beekeeping from some of the best beekeepers in the world. He left Dayton's uh, in 1985 to start his own business, Honey Tree Nursery, and operated 200 highs, including a seven year commitment as a municipal arborist and park superintendent. Mike has spent his entire year growing and caring for plants and trees. He's co-founder of the Grand Rapids Area Bee Club. Mike was a well-received speaker at the 2015 Heartland Agricultural Society meeting where he launched his presentations on trees and their relationship with bees and other pollinators. Since then, he has uh, been honored to speak at dozens of arboriculture, um, garden and beekeeping groups in several states as well as uh, multiple Michigan Beekeepers Association state meetings. Mike published Pollen and Nectar Producing Trees of the Great Lakes and Northeast um, of Benefit to Honeybees and Other Pollinators in 2017 with Wickwaz Press and it's still available. Visit honeytreenursery.com where Honey Tree Nursery's goal is to promote and pol uh, provide pollinator trees and sister company uh, Honey Tree Arborist Services um, promotes healthy trees using integrated pest management techniques and pollinator protection. We are very uh, lucky to have Mike uh, with us tonight. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and let Mike take over. Okay. I can still see you, Tony. You're... There you go. Okay, I guess I'm going to go ahead and start talking. Um, thank you for that introduction. I do appreciate that. And thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you. I already have a question on the screen whether I've dealt with, uh, was it chestnut trees? Yes, have I dealt with chestnuts or chestnut bee? I think it's chestnut trees. Um, yes, I have. Um, we'll talk about that further into the discussion. So let me start right away with a, with a PowerPoint. So give me just a moment, please. Get this up. Slideshow from beginning. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Ah, good, trees and bees. So this is a talk I put together for you folks. And uh, you know, I, I have this habit of just wanting to drone on and on because I'm so passionate about trees and passionate about bees. So. I'm gonna hold a knife to my throat and keep myself in time here. And in case I start to talk over, Tony or one of you guys, feel free to say, shut up. So let's go ahead on that basis. So I'm gonna to talk to you tonight about trees and bees. And uh, actually the way I got started in that was I took a trip up to Michigan's Upper Peninsula several years ago with my wife. And I stopped at a farmer's market and uh, there was a guy selling honey and he was selling basswood honey, but he didn't know it. Back in the days when I worked at Daydance, uh, we used to buy, we were one of the branches that used to buy a lot of honey and uh, we would buy it and grade it and then resell it. And uh, basswood honey was always a premium. And I told this guy, that's really good basswood honey. And he had no idea what he was selling. And he said, I didn't know basswoods produced honey. So that kind of got me going on how this was a, basically a, a full-time beekeeper in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. He was a president of a local club and he didn't know where his honey was coming from. So I started to do a little more research and started talking to people about honey sources. And uh, by way of background, um, 
you know, he mentioned that I'm an arborist. I'm a tree physician, not a mortician. And that's how I sell myself to the public. I don't take trees down. I'd rather save trees. And I use integrated pest management. I use whatever techniques I can to try to save trees. And that doesn't put me in a conflicted position where a lot of arborists are. Um, I can go and look at a tree and say the tree's dead, but I'm not going to take it down. A lot of guys will go out and say, your tree's dead. Oh, by the way, I can take that down for you. And I get called out to give second opinions on a lot of those where the tree's not dead. Uh, got called out the other day to look at an oak tree that was condemned by a guy with a chainsaw uh, because it had oak well. And I said, where's the oak tree? And, uh, you know, there was a condominium association and they showed me the oak tree. And I said, that's an elm. So the guy was going to take down an elm tree for oak well. So that allows me not to be in a conflicting position. Um, the other thing is I'm a nursery grower. We grow, uh, these are some larger white pines. Sometimes we spade them all with a large truck. And here's a, here's a uh, project I did uh, planting in a reclamation area where I put in pollen and nectar producing trees to uh, reclaim some land that never should have been taken out of the wild. And uh, this farmer was required because of the slope running down to water to plant this. And so we went in and planted all the honey trees. And we've done, oh, I don't know, maybe a dozen jobs like that so far. And I'm, as he mentioned, I'm also a beekeeper. I bought my first hive in 1966. You do the math. Um, I built that up to 200 hives. I don't have 200 hives now. I have maybe six. And that's plenty. It keeps my fingers in it. I was a data branch manager for seven years, and I was co-sponsor of the Grand Rapids Bee Club, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Now, I did a little bit of research on Massachusetts, and you guys have issues. According to the Bee Informed Partnership, Massachusetts lost 47% of its bees in 2019-2020. That's the total winter all-colony loss. Now, that is actually not just winter loss. That's year that's like January 1 to January or to December 31st loss. Um, that's also summer loss. You lose half of your bees every year. And you know that. If you're not familiar with the Bee Informed Partnership, you should get on their website. And they have a lot of data. And it's really interesting data. They do a lot of work. They do a lot of research. And that they present that data to beekeepers such as you and me. So we look at the problems with bees. And, you know, one of the problems that we have is, of course, disease and pests. You're all familiar with this little critter, the Varroa mite. And the Varroa mite has been the focus of most of our attention in club meetings. We talk about Varroa mite. We talk about how if your bees are dead, they probably are dead from Varroa mite. Um, even though it looks like they starved to death, it was probably Varroa mite. And, uh, you know, Varroa mite has proven to be a really hard critter to control. And if you're not controlling Varroa mite, your bees are going to die. You've got to have some kind of a plan. And if that plan is breaking the brood or, or treating chemically, it, it doesn't matter to me as long as you've got a plan. Because without it, Varroa mite will kill your bees. More than 20 different viruses now have been tied in with Varroa mite. Think of a mosquito, a malaria-causing mosquito going around and biting all of your bees. And they're just a real problem. So we have disease and pests. We also have our old favorite diseases like American fowl brood. This was a huge problem back in the 70s, that and a, and a European fowl brood. And we hardly ever hear of it anymore, but it's still out there. And I think that's because our emphasis has been on Varroa and the American fowl brood. We don't teach enough about how to take care of that. But that's another topic for another time. Another thing killing our bees, of course, are pesticides. And... Uh, can be real significant in some areas. I grabbed this photo off of, uh, off of Google today. And I, I love this photo because I don't know what she's spraying. It's a vegetable garden. I see onions, I see, looks like peppers, maybe tomatoes, and she's in there spraying. Look at her personal protective gear. This would get, this would get my license suspended. If anybody saw me spraying like that, there's no, there's no eye protection, there's no hand protection. I think she's in her pajamas and she's out there spraying. But what I've noticed as a professional arborist is that when I get called out and I get called out a lot because people's trees are dying, 
often it's because of a pesticide misapplication. There are pesticides out there that homeowners should not have access to. Some of the Roundup products contain imaziclear. Imaziclear, if you spray it in your driveway, it will kill your Norway spruce 50 feet away. Kill them. It'll kill your locust trees. And yet Roundup is selling this product. Uh, Bayer is now the owner of uh, Roundup. And it's a Roundup product. And uh, this is really causing a lot of serious issues with trees. But again, another topic for another time. Um, I've been involved in uh, a group in Michigan where we are trying to enhance the label on fungicides because fungicides will kill honeybees just as easily as insecticides. Even, even though they are fungicides, bees will take the fungicide back to the hive and uh, mix it in with the nectar. And the fungicides in a hive, they keep the bees from being able to produce um, bee bread. Bee bread is a combination of nectar and pollen that's allowed to ferment. It can't ferment when fungicides are in, in with that nectar. So the baby bees starve, the young bees starve. So now we have 80 different fungicides in Michigan that contain a warning level, a warning label that that product can be dangerous for use on honeybees. And then of course, uh, the other insecticide that gets a lot of hype are the neonic neonicotinoids, um, neonics for short, imidacloprid and the other. I use neonicotinoids as a professional arborist. I am licensed, I'm certified, and I will really be bummed if they are totally banned for my use. Um, nothing works quite like them, but they are overused. Homeowners use them for everything, for flea control to, uh, you know, their roses. You know, and if a little bit is good, then a whole lot's got to be better. And they are deadly to bees. Parts per billion can affect bees. My biggest problem with the neonex is that they're applied to like seed corn. Seed, uh, the seed is planted. And as it's planted, we get the neonex come blowing off the seed as it goes through the planter, lands on the dandelions and the clover on the side of the field, and the bees pick it up, take it back to the hive. And again, parts per billion have negative effects on honeybees. So I wouldn't mind if it got uh, banned for use by the farmers uh, applying it as, as a seed pretreatment, but I don't want to see it banned totally because they're really a good class of chemicals when it comes to targeted use. And quite honestly, the substitutes are worse. All right, enough of that. The third problem that we run into besides pests and pesticides is forage and nutrition. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Forage and nutrition. You know, this is a pretty typical scene in Michigan. What is a bee supposed to survive on in an area like this, in a monoculture like this? There are some trees in the background, but they're done blooming. You know, as far as the bee is concerned, this area is nothing more than a desert. There's just nothing for them to eat. Sure, they'll go and gather some of that pollen off of the uh, corn when it's in pollen, for that period of time when it's in pollen, but it's not very nutritious to the bees. It's basically a desert. You know, and if, if all you're eating is corn pollen, that's no different than you just surviving on like just potatoes or just eggs. Nutritious? Yeah, but can you stand a solid diet of it? No. And this is also pretty typical of uh, the Midwest, um, Back during the dust bowl, bust, oh man, the dust bowl days when farmers were farming with uh, plows, mold board, mold board plows and turning the soil over and the soil was all blowing away. They were encouraged to plant these fence rows and these fence rows would stop erosion. They'd stop the wind from gaining speed. And they also had the added benefit of being wildlife corridors. So wildlife like pheasants and deer could go from field to field and be protected, and they had the unintended consequence of being a primary source of nectar and pollen for our pollinators. Unfortunately, now we've gone to no-till, so soil erosion is not such a big problem. Unfortunately, farmers are now running bigger and bigger equipment, so they're taking out the fence rows. These fence rows are vital to our wildlife. 
I work for a large dairy farm. I do all their tree work. And he takes out fence rows, did take out fence rows, like, uh, like it was nobody's business. Because it's easier to get the equipment in the field if you don't have to turn it around or go around these trees. He has a 32-row planter. He does 32 rows of corn at a time. He can do an 80-acre field, you know, while I'm eating my lunch. You know, it's, it's massive. The other thing, and the guy loves the land, the other thing is we had a drought a few years ago, and it was devastating to him. So he's put in all these center pivot irrigation systems. These things are huge, and fence rows get in the way. Trees and fence rows get in the way. So now all that wildlife corridor, all of those areas that provided habitat for our bees and our, our other pollinators is going. I've reached, out, I've reached a compromise with him. And if, and if a fence row doesn't have to go, he pays me to go in and I prune it up. That allows light to go in for his corn. I had to produce for him a financial statement of the advantages of paying me and my crew to prune those fence rows as opposed to him getting in the big excavators, ripping them out, and it's actually cheaper for the farmer to have them prune than it is to tear them out. And I was able to prove that to him. So now he's maintaining all the fence rows he can for the, for the uh, wildlife. That's the benefit. You know, the real thing is that he looks at the dollars. But um, farmers are approachable. So here's the bottom line. There are more than 2,000 species of plants in the Midwest that are visited by honeybees. We've seen them, you know, there are day lilies, there are, there are little garden flowers. Only a few, however, produce nectar abundantly and are sufficiently common to secure surplus honey. So let's look at this little pot of flowers on the, on the left. Maybe these flowers produce nectar abundantly, but can you keep a colony of bees alive on this? Nope. When we look in the trade magazines, and the gardening magazines, what are we encouraged to plant? We're encouraged to plant this for the bees. Is it gonna do the bees any good? Probably not. On the right, this will do the bees some good. We're going from hundreds of flowers to hundreds of thousands of flowers, all on one tree, all on one plant. And the footprint on this tree, this flowering crab apple, is probably less than the footprint of this pot of flowers. That is the amount of area it takes in the garden. These are my bees. You guys have snow. We don't. We've had very little snow this year. Uh, this is about the most we've seen all season. And uh, I wrap them in tar paper. Yep, I have good luck getting them through the winter. I have a bunk of hay on top with a um, sugar cake on the bottom with a lump of hay. And uh, in the spring, I throw the hay on the ground to keep the weeds down. So I have pretty good luck coming through the winter, but this is what my bees look like today. And I understand you guys have had some incredible storms. Here's a photo I took last April 28th of my bees. April 28th, um, so this would be, you know, mid-spring. Nice, I consider that a nice pattern of brood. Of brood. I run all six and a quarter frames, by the way. I don't have any hive bodies. And uh, we can see pollen on the bees, April 28th. The bees are doing fairly well, but let's back up a little bit. This is April 8th. This is 20 days earlier. And we can see the bees are bringing in pollen like crazy. You know, in fact, there's two colors of pollen here. There's this yellow pollen and there's this greenish gray pollen. And inevitably when I ask a group, where does the yellow pollen come from? They all say, and always say, unless they've heard a talk before, they always say dandelions. But look at our dates. This is April 8th, and dandelion pollen in Michigan doesn't come in until the last week of April. We're still 20 days from our first dandelion pollen. And another thing is just because it's yellow doesn't mean it's from dandelions. You know, dandelions have such dry electrostatically charged pollen, it actually is attracted to the bee hair by electrostatic charge. So the bees have to, you know, brush it down into their pollen basket and then add nectar to it. And when they do, it turns it orange. 
yellow pollen in the hive is never from dandelions. Even though there's a lot of it, this photo was taken the first week of May down near where I am. This happens to be that large dairy farmer I was mentioning, one of his hay fields, and I love this. I don't have any bees here yet, but I fully intend to. Actually, that pollen, that yellow pollen that you saw is coming off of willow. This is pussy willow, and it is the source of some of the earliest pollen we have in Michigan. The bees love it. The bees collect it. They put it into a pollen pellet. Notice the color is yellow. It's not the only yellow pollen, but it's the most abundant pollen coming in at this time. There's a native bee working our, uh, our uh, pussy willow. That gray-green pollen that you saw was coming from maples, specifically coming from red maples, first part of uh, April. Um, they're called red maples. They don't have red leaves. Red maples are our native Acer rubrums. They grow in the Midwest, in, I'm sure in Massachusetts, in swampy areas, in dry areas, in clay soil, and sandy soil. And they are one of the most common landscape plants. There are more than 200 cultivars, which means a cultivated variety of red maples in the trade. There are also hybrid varieties, and I really strongly recommend you not plant those. They're generally of no value to the bees because they're sterile. They don't have any seeds. They don't have any flowers. So this is important. In a study done by a friend of mine, Dr. Thomas Wood at MSU, he had to study solitary bees as part of one of his research product, projects. He was funded to study solitary bees, not honeybees. So he went around to every county in Michigan and did this for two years and he collected solitary bees, every variety that he could. He put them in the freezer. And in the winter time, he would identify the bees by genus species, where they were, numbers, and then he would collect the pollen. He'd brush it off of the bees if they had any. And this is what he found. And this is astounding. We have to, we have to figure that what was on the solitary bees is what our honeybees would be collecting because it's what's available. He found that 26% of all pollen collected in the month of April was coming from maples. Forget the dandelions, forget the yellow mustard, forget all that other stuff. 26% was coming off of maples. 33%, this is even more astounding to me, was coming off of the willows. And he couldn't identify the pollen by, you know, species, but he could by genus. So these two trees, maples and willows, were producing 59% of all the pollen collected by all the bees in the month of April, 59%. That's a huge, huge quantity. And it just shows how important these plants are to the bees. In the month of May, he found that 24% of all the pollen was coming off of cherries and apples. He didn't break it down between cherries and apples because you know he just didn't have the time or the ability to break down the pollen. Oop. 8% of all the pollen in June is coming off of the brambles. That would be the rubus. Those would be the blackberries, you know, the dewberries, the, the berries, anything that, that reaches out and grabs you with a vine with thorns. Those are the brambles. 8% of all the pollen in June is coming off the brambles. But this is really important. 18% is coming off the sumac. That's huge. So, 26% is coming off of two plants in the month of June, despite the fact we have so many plants in bloom in the month of June. You know, these are significant, this is significant research that he did. And then later in the season, it became uh, less evident uh, of any one plant until we came to goldenrods that were significant. This is a photo I took last spring, March 9th, of a silver maple in full bloom. Silver maples will bloom real early because they get pollinated real early. They have mature seeds by mid-May, which uh, drop off the trees and sprout. And by fall, you can have a uh, 12 to 18 inch seedling all in the same year. It's a great technique by the tree to colonize open niches um, one year. 
whereas other other trees like basswood, for instance, or or apple trees, you know, they produce their fruit one year, has to go through the winter, it sprouts in the spring. Well, by the time it sprouts, silver maples are 18 to 24 inches tall. They've already overtaken that opportunity. So uh, we could talk later about why they do that, but why why do silver maples produce, I'll, I'll be real quick, why do they produce nectar this early in the season? It's to keep their ovaries from freezing. They produce a lot of nectar, which is sugar syrup, which is a natural antifreeze. So when we get a snowstorm in March, their ovaries don't freeze. Close up of silver maple in full bloom. And this is interesting too. I, I had said that it's not just dandel, or I'm sorry, almost did it myself. It's not just willows producing yellow pollen, but alders produce a yellow pollen. Look at the amount of pollen these things have. It's amazing. And uh, somebody calculated the amount of pollen that's available on alders in an alder swamp, and it's like 1,500 pounds per acre. It's not very nutritious, but the bees will gather it. Okay, then we have our fruit and our cherry trees. This is a commercial orchard not too far from me. Um, and it's not just our fruit trees that our bees work. You know, like, like here's a honeybee on an apple blossom. But they also work the ornamental cherries and the ornamental apple trees. This is truly a meadow in the sky. You know, this really proves that that uh, if you were to spread all these flowers out and, uh, you know, like you would see in a meadow, this would cover a large, maybe thousands of square feet, certainly hundreds of square feet. So we have a meadow in the sky on one tree. And of course, the crab apples, uh, flowering crab apples come in many different shapes, sizes, more than 500 that are available commercially right now. You can get them different sizes, different colors. As far as I know, they're all productive for honeybees. Honeybee gathering pollen and nectar from this flowering crab apple tree. Blueberries are big in our area. Uh, we have hundreds of acres not too far from me. At the bottom of the screen, you can see all the blossoms and then there, these are the leaves coming out. But a close up of this shows uh, how many blossoms we have. You guys have huckleberries up your way. We have a lot of uh, blueberries, closely related, and we can get a honey crop off of blueberries if your bees are strong enough. You know, I get asked a lot, what about ornamental pear? Aren't they a fruit tree? Well, ornamental pears, I hate them. And I hate them because as an arborist, I get called to deal with them. And for years, I looked to see what is pollinating these things because they have fruit, they have that annoying little pear that drops on the sidewalk. And, uh, but I never saw a bee ever. I never saw a solitary bee. I never saw a honeybee working these pears. But because of my, you know, what I do for a living, I'm out all the time. So I keep checking these ornamental pears. And then two years ago, ha, there's a honeybee working the ornamental pear. And then I started just paying a lot more attention to these pear trees. And I started thinking, well, you know, pear, tree, pear trees put out this big signal. These big white flags in the sky are a signal to pollinators that say, hey, come and pollinate me, check it out. But putting out nectar and pollen utilizes so many resources from the tree that a lot of these trees only produce nectar for a couple hours a day or maybe an hour a day. A lot of trees do this. You know, they keep their scape up there to keep the bees checking it out, but then they only produce nectar for an hour or two. Um, I have discovered that at least in our area, ornamental pears only produce nectar and are only, are only uh, attractive to bees during the time period 10 a.m. to noon. Check it before that. No bees. Check it after that. No bees. Doesn't seem to matter on the weather. Doesn't seem to matter on the temperature. I will never, I, I have never seen a honeybee on an ornamental pear afternoon. And I've never seen one before 10 o'clock. So do they work them? Yes. Um, do they get much from them? Can't say. 
I have this photo in here because I had lunch one time with a guy who's a famous author and he writes about bees in the garden and that type of thing. And he was telling me, I mean, he also hates ornamental pears, but he said to me, you will never, ever find ever a native bee working a non-native plant. And I about choked on my chicken. And I said, what? And he said, you'll never find it. You'll never find a native bee on a non-native plant. I, it was, that's ludicrous. That's absolutely a ludicrous statement. So I've sent him a lot of photos and uh, he's never responded. But this is a native bee on a non-native plant and native bees don't care where the plant's from. If it's producing nectar and pollen, it's the same way with our honeybees. They utilize the resources that is there. Of course, you can do really ugly things with these ornamental pears too. Uh, the brambles, this is a blackberry. We can get a honey crop off of blackberries in Michigan. These blackberries will grow uh, right on the edge of fields. They grow in poor soil. They grow on disturbed soil and they'll take over an area and uh, the honeybees love them. And it's easy to tell when the bees are working them because they bring back this chocolate brown pollen and uh, really productive. You'll have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of honeybees working blackberry plants. Uh, blackberry plants are often growing with multiflora rose. And when you get these two plants growing in between each other, which happens a lot, it's really hard to tell the flowers apart. You have to go right back to the leaf. Uh, this is another one I was told that no native bee will ever work a multiflora rose. And uh, well, huh, what's that? But multiflora rose were introduced because they are a, a, a wildlife resource. Um, they were planted for, uh, you know, erosion control. They were planted for wildlife, for pheasants, for cover, and they've just taken over and they've become just a terrible plant to have. Uh, then our last one that uh, Dr. Wood mentioned are the sumacs. And before I talk about sumacs, I want to mention poison sumac. Poison sumac is not a sumac. I'm going to go right out there and say it. It's in the cashew family. It's in the fa same family as our sumacs, but it's in, a, it's in a different genus. We shouldn't be calling these plants poison sumac. We should call them like poison vernix or poison something else. It's like calling a muskrat a rat. You know, it's not a rat. It's more closely related to a rabbit. We should call them marsh rabbits or something. But don't call poison sumac a sumac. Unfortunately, because of poison sumac, which I see grows in your area, and it grows in my area, poison sumac only grows without exception in water. Only, period, no exceptions. It will not grow up on dry ground. It will not grow in the gravel pit. It will not grow in your backyard. It's got to have wet feet. So when people say, oh, I don't like sumac because it's poisonous, they don't know what they're talking about. Poison sumac is poisonous, but it's not really a sumac, okay? So I wanna be real clear about that. Don't cut down your sumacs because you think they're poisonous. And sometimes, I've had the occasion to, uh, you know, bite into a real sumac just to show people they're not poisonous. So we have four sumacs which grow in your area and my area, which are beneficial to bees. We have fragrant sumac, which I don't have a photo of. Um, they bloom real early in the spring and rarely do I see bees on them. I shouldn't have said they're beneficial. Um, the first beneficial sumac we have is the smooth sumac. It blooms in our area about, uh, you know, the 1st of June. That'll be in bloom for about two weeks. And then it's followed, but here's smooth sumac. And then it's followed by the staghorn sumac, which will also be in bloom for about two weeks. So we get almost a solid month of sumac in bloom in Michigan. I don't know what you get in Massachusetts. I suspect it's similar. The only real difference between the two is that Smooth blooms earlier. Smooth doesn't have hairy stems. Staghorn does. You know, that's the easy way to tell them apart. The staghorn blooms later in the season. They both have 
this red cone that you can use for smoker fuel. And I will make um, lemonade out of these as soon as they turn red. You can soak them in, uh, in hot water and make tea out of them. And it's really good. It, I mean, I'm telling you, it's really good. You should try it. It's kind of a lemon flavored tea. Now here's my favorite sumac, and this is called winged sumac. This is the most productive sumac that we have in Michigan. And it blooms later in the season. This blooms about when basswoods are in bloom or after. I've been selecting um, winged sumac in my area that bloom later and later in the season and I propagate them. This plant could really serve a function as a prime nectar source in the month of August. I have some now that bloom in August. And uh, I'm really excited about it because I keep selecting those and propagating those. And I think if we could just get those out there in the wild, you know, our, our August dearth that we have didn't used to be the dearth. It used to be a prime honey, uh, honey period because of a plant called a spotted knapweed, which I think you have, also known as star thistle, and our white sweet clover. And uh, they've been deemed invasive, they're not native. And so our DNR is going through great efforts to uh, get rid of them. They're being kind of successful. Dr. Wood said that, who I've mentioned before, has said that if we eliminate star thistle and white sweet clover from the state of Michigan, we will eliminate our bumblebees because they are totally dependent upon those two invasive species. So we need to take a close look at our unintended consequences. But this is winged sumac. Love this plant. And Peter Littner in his book, Garden Plants for Honeybees, says it has the highest density of bees on flowers I have ever observed. Uh, winged sumac, between the leaves on these little petioles, they have wings. That's how you tell them apart. They're also smaller. They're also called a dwarf sumac. They're smaller than our standard sumacs. So if you see these wings and you see them blooming about the 4th of July or later, it's a flame sumac or a wing sumac. And the bees love them. All right. Now I want to talk about the American basswood, which used to be our premier honey plant. Uh, they're not as common as they used to be. They have a potential of 80 to 1100 pounds of honey per acre. Um, my source for that is Wikipedia. I've tried to find the original source and I have to admit I can't. Um, I'll keep pursuing it. This may be one of those self-perpetuating, well, Wikipedia says it, therefore everybody else says it, therefore Wikipedia says it. I don't know. I wanna find the original source of this kind of production. Uh, this is American basswood in bloom. It's visited by bumblebees, our native bees, our honeybees. And what I like about American basswood, the American basswood puts out an incredible honey when it puts out honey, which might be every other year, every second year, every third year, depending on the plant, the soil conditions, because the tree puts out so much of its reserve in order to put out a honey crop in order to get pollinated to set seeds that it just physically can't expend the energy every year. So it puts out a full blast of, of uh, flowers one year and then it's got to rest. It's got to build up its reserves again. Some trees can do it every other year, some every third, some every fourth, some two out of five. So it's not dependable like that. But when it's in bloom, it can be your largest source of nectar that you have your entire season. And what I also like is I took this photo during a light rain and, you know, they've got all these little umbrellas over the flowers and the flowers hang down. And bees will work these immediately after the rain. The nectar is still there. We have European varieties of uh, basswood. We call them lindens in Europe and basswoods in the U.S. Little leaf linden, now it will bloom every year. And so that has an advantage over the American basswood. Although the trees don't get as large, it will bloom every year. It has a major bloom, a minor bloom, a major bloom, a minor bloom, but it does provide nectar every single season. 
This is a little leaf linden at one of my customers. This is a tree I take care of. This happens to be over his swimming pool. So his wife hates this tree and keeps trying to get me to have it taken down. And I say, no, I'm not taking that down. It's a beautiful tree and it is a beautiful tree. And her husband agrees and he picks up all those little umbrellas, nets them off the pool and they start to come down in huge quantities. But this thing is just a swarm of bees when it's in bloom. Another common linden that we have is the silver linden. When you look at the sequence of bloom, silver, blo silver linden blooms first. Notice it's called silver linden because it's silvery on the underside of the leaves, dark green on the top. Silver linden blooms first, little leaf linden blooms second, and then American basswood blooms third. That's pretty consistent where I am. I'm not saying it won't change for you, but it's pretty consistent where I am. And the silver linden probably smells the best of all of them. It's like somebody has opened up perfume and they bloom at a younger age than the little leaf linden or the American basswood. These will bloom at just like four or five years old. And they're a beautiful plant. The white is caused by little tiny hairs on the bottom side of the leaf, which means Japanese beetles don't touch them. So if you have Japanese beetle problem and you want a flowering linden tree, go with the silver linden. It has a nice pyramid shape, good for the bees, and it's not bothered by Japanese beetles. Little leaf lindens are, by the way. So here's a fun fact. Two mature basswood trees can produce as much nectar as an acre of sweet clover. So my question is, which one fits in your backyard? Mature basswood tree, about 4,200 square feet. 120 pounds potential yield per tree when they're in bloom. Now, those are the major trees that we have that grow over most of our entire state and grow over the entire Midwest. I think you're probably quite similar, but there are some other significant trees. Um, redbud, not significant for us, but south of us in Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, I have been told that redbuds can be a significant source of honey. I don't know if that's true in Massachusetts, uh, not true in Michigan, but uh, I know that our bumblebees love these trees. Beautiful tree. Ah, one of the most significant trees for, you know, hoping for a honey crop is the black locust. They're, uh, they're called acacia in Europe. And in Europe, acacia honey is a premium honey. And it has supposed medicinal value. And so acacia honey in Germany and in the uh, provinces around Russia is a specialty crop. It's extracted and it's kept isolated and sold as a, mono, um, a monofloral crop. I have a friend in Northern Illinois, who works all season to get a monofloral crop off black locust because he sells it at a premium price and he sells it for about twice the price of regular honey. Most of his customers are from Europe and they know it's fine flavor and they know, uh, you know, they believe in its medicinal values. It also doesn't crystallize. Um, eventually, I think it will, but pure black locust honey or acacia honey very rarely crystallizes. Unfortunately, where we are, it uh, often is susceptible to late frost. We'll get our last frost about, oh, the third week in May. And that's just about when these buds are set and it'll freeze them off. Um, but you can see when they're in bloom, they're just, uh, just a smorgasbord for the pollinators. Here's an early monarch coming up, feeding on this uh, black locust tree. Our native bees and our honeybees love them too. Um, one last thing is that I can always predict when we'll get our most severe spring storm, and that's if they don't freeze, the day after these things come into full bloom, we'll get our strongest storm of the season. You know, and it blows the, it blows and knocks the blossoms off these trees and they're done. But if you can get a year and sidestep the storms and sidestep the late frost, you'll get a major honey crop off black locusts. I know you either love them or you hate them. Um, I have used these as city trees 
when I'm on a parks department because they're tough. They fix their own nitrogen. You can plant them in a coffin in a sidewalk. Kids don't like to climb them because they've got these little tiny thorns on them. Um, they're pretty bulletproof. And if you mow around them or keep them confined in a coffin, uh, which is what we call street planting locations, they will do very well. Another, another plant that's invasive is the autumn olive. Um, autumn olive was introduced into the United States uh, for wildlife, and it was purposely brought in for our pheasants. They produce a large crop of berries that the or fruit that the pheasants and the quail like. They also produce a good honey crop. When our autumn olives are in bloom, you can fill, and I am not exaggerating, you can fill a super in a day. The nectar comes in so strong that if there's a hole in the comb, the bees will fill it. And if the queen hasn't laid an egg in it, your brood area will become filled with this nectar immediately. In fact, when this happens, I tell people, bees are gonna start swarming, autumn olives are in bloom, mid-May, and inevitably your bees will swarm. You know, this is the final trigger because there's no more room in the hive. They will fill every crevice and your comb turns bright white and it's just absolutely magical. And it only lasts for a few days, but the entire area smells like perfume is in the air. Now you guys have this out there and I don't know if it performs like it does for us, but it's a major honey crop. Don't plant it, don't spread it. The stuff has a mind of its own. You cut it down, you make it mad, it re-sprouts. You try to dig it up, you make all the root pieces go, hey, I'm gonna grow. It's tough to control, but it's a great honey crop. Uh, that question that we had on chestnuts, Chinese chestnuts do very well and they don't have any serious disease issues. They're a good wildlife plant. They bloom about the 4th of July. I marvel when I look at chestnut trees. We still have a few American chestnuts in the area. Can you imagine when one out of three trees on the East Coast was a chestnut tree and they all bloomed? Can you imagine the honey crops that we would get if chestnuts were still around? I am just amazed at the potential honey crops we've lost because of that invasive fungus. One out of three trees, you know, it's just phenomenal to me. Um, I, as an arborist, I deal with the supposedly resistant varieties of chestnuts. And so far, I have to say that I'm not impressed. Um, I had to go out to look at one of the quote resistant varieties uh, last year. And as soon as I drove up, I could see the chestnut had chestnut blight, big orange pustules on the side of the trunk. Um, you know, there's no doubt that tree had to be cut down, ground up, destroyed. And uh, actually this poor lady had several of them that, you know, they were from Michigan State. They're part of the resistant strains of chestnuts. I'm not convinced yet that we've achieved resistance. If you back cross the American chestnut with the Chinese chestnut, with such as the Dunstan hybrid, you get a tree that's a fairly close, um, you know, it looks fairly close to an American chestnut. But, um, and I've never seen the Dunstan yet with uh, the chestnut blight, but it's not a pure chestnut. And it's good for bees, it's good for wildlife, and uh, they're sold usually as a, uh, as a tree uh, for deer because they produce fruit at an early age. So we can talk more about chestnuts later, but uh, you know, the Chinese chestnuts kind of an acceptable substitute for the American. It's not the same, I realize that. It's not native, I understand that. Um, but you can find the Chinese chestnuts by uh, you know, looking at all the animal tracks because the turkeys and the deer love Chinese chestnut fruit. All right, another locally important tree is the tulip poplar. Tulip poplar is unique and it's subject of debate as to why they do it, but they have nectaries around the flower bud. They are producing nectar before the flower opens. So much nectar that it will drip down onto the leaves and turn the leaves white. Um, 
my personal opinion is you've got this teacup shaped and teacup sized flower that's pointing straight up. And if it opens the morning of a thunderstorm, it's not going to get pollinated because all the nectar is going to get washed out. So my theory is it's producing all this nectar and coming from nectaries that the bees are already at this tree. So the moment it opens, the bees just go, eh, I'll go in and get some of that nectar and they pollinate the tree. This, I was so happy to find this. I was out doing a job with a helper and this uh, tulip tree is in full bloom and the nectar was running out of the flower. And this nectar was so thick, it was like carol syrup. And of course, we had to taste it. It wasn't bad. I wanted to come back the next day to test the uh, water, the moisture content, and we we didn't get back the next day. In fact, it rained for a couple of days after that. Um, so by the time we did get back, the flowers were done, and there was no more nectar. But look at the sugar. That is sugar on the leaf. So if you've got bees in an area like this, you can get a monofloral honey crop just off tulip poplar. I love tulip poplars. Black gum, also known as Tupelo, um, not productive in Michigan. There's a variety of uh, black gum that grows down south, swamp Tupelo, that uh, you can get a monofloral honey crop off of those. American holly, not many of them around in Michigan. A few along the lakeshore. I think you have them out in Massachusetts. I know they're in Connecticut. That's why I included the slide. You can get a real crop of honey off American holly. Privet, uh, planted, it's not native. Uh, been planted in all across the U.S. It's become a real pest down south, like in Georgia. The bees love it. All of the pollinators love it. And it produces so much pollen. Look at the pollen dropping on the leaves below the flowers. When this stuff's in bloom, you can smell it from a quarter mile away. It's not invasive in Michigan. I don't know what's going on in Massachusetts, um, but it's definitely invasive down south. Button bush. I've read reports of 200 pounds of button bush honey per acre. This blooms in July. It's a great plant. It grows in the water. It's one of those few trees that can live its whole life with its roots covered in water. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bees love it. Um, kind of a cool plant. Attractive to aphids. See the aphids on here? So the aphids are also working this button bush. And uh, this is what it looks like out in the wild. It's a beautiful plant. Smells good. It has this real unique flower. Good name for it, button bush. Um, want to draw your attention to the paniculata hydrangeas. Hydrangeas are broken into several groups. There are the flat top and there are the, the uh, oak hydrangeas, uh, et cetera. There are the paniculata hydrangeas, which are the pyramid-shaped flower, okay? The cone-shaped flower. PG hydrangea is a paniculata. Um, this one is called limelight and very, very attractive to honeybees, bumblebees, native bees. And if you have the choice and you want to plant a hydrangea at your house, the paniculatas are the ones to plant because they are a good source of nectar for the bees. Um, many varieties are available in the trade and paniculatas can be significant. Another tree that I wish there were more of, it's not native, is the Japanese pagoda tree. It blooms in August. In August, this thing is a giant, this tree is 75 feet tall. This tree is a giant source of nectar for our bees. And it's just like the black locust, except it doesn't care if it freezes. This thing will bloom every year. It doesn't care if a thunderstorm comes along. It's in bloom. These are massive trees. And I wish we had more of these planted. Another one that I think has great potential in the landscape is the seven suns tree. This was introduced from um, Asia back in the 1980s with a lot of um, ho you know, hoopla because this is a great plant. I am really glad they did because they no longer exist in their native range. They are extinct. They don't, there are no more of these in their native range. What happened to them? I don't know. 
but the only ones we have are the ones that somebody picked and uh, you know cultivated and now has in the trade. There are a lot of plants like that, by the way, that don't exist in nature anymore, but only exist in nurseries. Seven Suns tree blooms in September. Notice the white bloom in September. This is about the first part of September. The real claim to fame, although they're as attractive as a BB tree, you know, there's hardly a flower without a bee on it, is that uh, the calyx, which are the leaves underneath the flower, turn bright red. And it's just as attractive as the rest of the tree, more attractive, it draws real interest. This is a tree I took a photo of on November 1st, two years ago. November 1st is beautiful. They also have this really cool looking bark that kind of, you know, strips off and uh, exfoliates. It's kind of a pretty tree. Everybody ought to have one of these. They don't have any serious pests or diseases and they're a great landscape plant. So can, my conclusion is the largest potential nectar and pollen yield per acre is from trees. So what can you do? Learn your local pollen and nectar producing plants. You're gonna find that many of them, and I say most of them are trees. Plan appropriate trees. I am on several different tree boards for several different municipalities. And I encourage them to plant pollinator friendly trees and they do. They take my advice as an arborist. They think, oh, that's warm, fuzzy. We're gonna plant pollinator friendly trees. Never tell them it's bee friendly. Tell them it's pollinator friendly and they all go, oh, wonderful. And I can provide them with a list of pollinator friendly trees. They plant them or I plant them or somebody plants them. And none of those are pears by the way. And uh, suddenly we have a city full of pollinator friendly trees. Encourage and maintain habitat. And I like this 10% attitude, which I try talking to the local farmers, maintain 10% of your property for the bees. Let it grow to pollinator plants. Let it grow to uh, you know, trees and other plants and shrubs, which produce pollen and nectar for your bees. This maintaining the habitat thing is real significant. A lot of the most important trees we have grow in wetlands, they grow in swamps. Your red maples, your willows, um, your button bush, they all grow in wet areas, they all grow in swamps. If we can keep our swamps going, we'll maintain a lot of these, uh, these uh, pollinator friendly plants. This is a good example of maintaining pollinator friendly trees. We were doing a job at a McDonald's, this gal was working for me a couple of years ago, good worker by the way, and this is a tulip poplar, it's over a hundred feet tall and it's growing right on the property line of the McDonald's in an area they were developing for a gas station. All right, I hate this. This was on a Thursday, that's on a Friday. Thursday, Friday, I was horrified, absolutely horrified. There was no reason Zero reason to take off this tree. It was on the corner of the property. Wasn't hurting a thing. So you know what they replaced it with? Three blue spruce. Three blue spruce. Three of the crappiest trees you can plant in your landscape. And they took out a hundred foot tall heritage ancient tree and they put in three lousy alien blue spruce. I talked to the guys that did this. I said, what'd you do that for? And they said, we were told you clear out everything from fence line to fence line. I would love to have talked to the uh, developer and get them to save that tree. Had I known, I'm not ashamed to do that kind of thing. I do that kind of thing all the time. I've stopped at farmers taking down, taking down fence rows and saying, what are you doing? And I even had one guy with tears in his eyes one day because he finally realized what he was doing was of no benefit. He was costing himself extra work and he was harming the wildlife and the pollinators. He was taking out a fence row of cherries and basswoods. And once I explained it to him, he was on my side. He just didn't know. I'm not ashamed to stop and tell people or ask people what they're doing. I wish we could have saved this tree, but we couldn't. All right, well, thank you very much. This is Yellowwood, by the way. Um, good street tree.
So here's my contact information. So I'll open this up to questions. Let me get out of here. If you want, get the contact information down. I don't check my email every day. I admit it, but I do check my email. We also have a website, honeytreenursery.com. And I don't do this to sell honey trees. I do this because it's my passion. I do this because I want people to understand the relationship between bees and trees. Okay, let me get out of here. Stop share. Are there any alders that are would look good in a yard? Yeah, actually there are. There's a European alder and that is used as a landscape tree and it is just as productive as our native alders. It will get to be about 50, 60 feet tall oh, wow. and it has a pyramidal shape and it fixes its own nitrogen. I like the European alder. It will grow in absolute crappy soil. You never have to fertilize it because it fixes its own nitrogen. I've used a lot of them in cityscapes. Um, they may grow a little too fast is the problem and people get a little worried, but um, um, you know, I like them in the right setting. They're, they're a good tree. All right, question is, uh, okay, Danelli, okay. I don't grow BB trees, like I said before, because I've been told they may become invasive and I don't wanna be that guy. You know, that guy that everybody looks back at and says, you're the guy who started the newest invasion, you know, like Paulinia or um, some of the other trees that have become invasive, you know, the uh, autumn olive, for instance. How about our native birches? Wind pollinated, no real benefit to bees. Uh, it's been speculated that bees gather some propolis off the birches. I don't know if that's true. Uh, from Will Wind, black locust is considered invasive here. And I would say yes, um, some states, some municipalities, some areas have, have listed them as invasive. They're an invasive alien. They're not an invasive native. They're, they're uh, native to the Appalachian Mountains. They were brought in. I have seen black locusts coming into Michigan all on their own. I think that their natural range is changing just like it is on so many of our other trees. Nothing is staying the same. Nothing ever has stayed the same. Um, you know, people say they only want native trees and I'll say, okay, well, we'll plant native chestnuts, native elms. You know, we can start with native ash. They're all gonna die. Shoot, we can put in a native redwood if you want to. It won't live, but we can. Um, so the forests that we have today are not the forests that we'll have for our grandchildren. The forests that our grandparents had are not the forests we have today. Remember, remember one third of every tree on the East Coast was an American chestnut. Then one out of three was an elm. They're both gone. Then one out of three was an ash. They're gone. Now one out of three is an oak. We're having tremendous problems in Michigan with oak wilt hitting all the red oaks, black oaks, pin oaks. Um, you know, one out of three, what's going to be left? You know, box elder? I, I don't know. I know the black locust is considered invasive. I still think they're a great honey tree and um, I still plant them, but I plant them where they can be mowed around or be confined. Um, there's a chestnut that has a wheat germ added. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, there was a story on that on NPR a couple of weeks ago. I listened to that. It has the uh, gene inserted into it to make it resistant to our um, chest up light. And uh, definitely a lot of research has been done into that. And again, you have to make up your own mind about that because, you know, call me, you know, yell at me, hit me if you want to, but I'd rather have a chestnut with a wheat uh, DNA in it than I would no chestnuts. Um, you know, you can put a spinach gene in and that's been done on fruit trees. Uh, I don't know. 
that doesn't bother me terribly because we don't have any chestnuts. If we had chestnuts and we're doing that, that's another argument. But uh, we can have that discussion later. American Holly is native here. Cool. Button bush looks like the coronavirus. Yes, it does. Uh, question, what about mulberry trees? Mulberry trees are wind pollinated. Bees do not touch them. Oh, I did not know that. Yep. They're entirely wind pollinated. Although they look like they should be pollinated by bees, they're not. Even the Asian one? The Korean? The, uh, Morris, uh, we have Morris Alba and Morris Rubrum here. I don't know about the Asian. Have to do some research on that, but probably all the mulberries are wind pollinated. Okay. Uh, my rhododendron maximum native has lots of, really, lots of native bees every spring. That makes sense, you know, because they're both native to the area. Um, you know, in uh, book B Biology, uh, about page seven or so, they talk about how rhododendron honey is toxic. You know, um, was used against one of the invading armies. Make them sick. And uh, I don't remember the entire story, but it's kind of interesting. Our, um, our rhododendrons here are visited by, first of all, they're not native to Michigan, but our rhododendrons are visited by bumblebees. Thank you, Mike Champion, for the trees and hedgerows. Absolutely. I have some old Norwegian maples I love to say, but they're considered tall and old. Can they be cut back very low? By Norwegian, I assume you mean Norway maples. Um, they are really susceptible to a fungus called verticillium wilt. So any pruning that happens on Norway maples, first of all, they can, yes, be trimmed back. They can be cut back very low. And I wouldn't be afraid to do what's called a pollard on them. I, I hate I hate it when people go in and cut the tops out of trees. But if you're trying to save the tree, and then you are you are um, following that up by proper pruning afterwards, um, you know if it saves the tree, go for it. But only do it in the winter because we have a serious problem with verticillium wilt now. What do I think about root washing before planting trees? I do it all the time. So that's, that's what I think about that. What trees generate the most propolis? Um, I talked to uh, Marvis Vivek one time at a meeting and I said, Marv, uh, what produces the most propolis? And she said, pines. And I said, not poplars? And she goes, nope. And she's done a lot of research on that at, in Minnesota at the Bee Lab. And without a doubt, it's the, uh, I just lied, I'm so sorry. Poplars produce the most propolis, not pines. Um, I entirely misspoke. My impression has always been that it's pines that produce propolis, but it's the poplars. And she does a lot of talks. She has articles written about it. And that would be good for you to research on, uh, on the web. But without a doubt, it's the poplar trees. In fact, she says that areas without poplar trees the bees have a higher incidence of disease because propolis is a natural disinfectant and bees will coat the inside of their hives, natural hives, with propolis. And she thinks they do that to keep the virus low down. Also research has been done on a side note about different fungus and how bees will work different types of fungus. You'll see bees working sawdust um, they may be working that sawdust in order to get the fungus to take back to the hive. There's been some work done on that. That fungus is taken back to the hive where it has a natural antiviral and antifungal um, effect. Great presentation. I had bees coming in with red pollen, so told me it was chestnut. Yeah, it probably was. Yeah, chestnut. Depends on the time of year. There's another red pollen that'll come in early in the spring, and that's off of a local ground cover and it's called um, lamium um, spotted or it's a uh, dead nettle and that will be a red pollen also. Korean bee tree, like I said, I'm a little bit afraid of it. So I don't grow it, but you know, if they're worried about black locusts being invasive, I'm afraid Korean bee tree might be too someday. Catalpa also have flower nectaries 
I have never seen a honeybee work in it. Those nectaries are on the leaves. They think that those are there in order to draw ants. And the ants protect the trees from other pests is the theory. I don't know. I talked to Dr. Wang at Michigan State University. He has some great photos of bees actually working those nectaries on catalpa. Um, I'm not seeing it. Zach Wang is his name. He has some good photos. Yep, propolis, I think. She said it's a good propolis tree. That's absolutely right. What's the best fruit tree for pollinators? Not I'm going to say, I'm sorry. Not, not pears. pears. Yeah, not pears. Um, it depends what you're after. Ironically, I went to a talk and a guy from Canada said that the most complete pollen on any plant comes from fruit pears, Asiatic pears. It's the most complete pollen. Um, the best fruit tree for nectar, in my opinion, would be the Japanese cherries. The bees absolutely go nuts on them. They're producing nectar and pollen off of these cherries. And that would be the ornamental cherries, the um, Kwanzaa cherries, um, Mazard cherries, which have gone feral. Um, I like those Japanese varieties, Asiatic varieties. The cherries are always a draw for the bees. Um, best fruit tree for pollinators. Most frequent feral colony tree. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Can you explain that a little bit? I, I, uh, my guess would be uh, the trees that bees would move into uh, in terms of making cavities. But um, who asked that question? Um, was that, uh, yeah, this is, Tom. Right. yeah, yep. okay. exactly. Uh, which tree does, uh, do bees like to move into the most? Traditionally, um, it has been the black locust. Second would be the black gum trees down South. Those are the most frequent feral colony trees because they're hollow and they're hard and they have a cavity. Um, usually very attractive to bees. So I, those, I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I've seen, uh, watching uh, many YouTubes on this and plus seeing them here. Uh, Catalpa also has a lot of hollows that I've yep. seen. That would be in. a good one too. You asked about white pine. Man, I've never seen, first of all, I don't see very many hollow white pines. Um, do you have a, do you know anything about white pine? Uh, only that the um, the wood is a lot softer and, and maybe offers, uh, I know sometimes they chew the uh, softer wood wooded trees. And I do know of one bee tree in uh, Harvard that uh, okay. is still there. It's been there for 30 years. Yeah, white pine are a long-lived tree. But then again, so are the gum trees and the uh, black locust. Um, I think that's where the term bee gum came from because uh, they were traditionally found in gum trees. You know, that's just a, a thought experiment. Um, good question though. How are linden trees? There are a few mature ones in my neighborhood and bees devour them in late June. Yes, linden trees are basswoods. Linden is just the term used in Europe. They're one of the best honey plants that we have. Um, Japanese weeping cherry, yes. Snow fountain is a good example of a Japanese weeping cherry. Hygen uh, is another good one that bees love them. Thank you. Bees like to live in. Okay. Ah, Juneberry, service berry. Let's talk about that for a minute. Service berry in Michigan are zero productive. They are insect pollinated. They are like the pear tree as far as I'm concerned. They're a beautiful, beautiful plant. In Michigan, they offer very little, if any, value to our honeybees or even our native bees. They are pollinated by insects. I, that's another one where I have studied and studied and studied and looked and looked and looked at June berries. I used to grow June berries in the nursery. Never did I see a bee on them, ever. And I mentioned that one day at a bee meeting and a friend of mine sent me a photo 
of a honeybee on a Juneberry leaf. And uh, I, I called him up and I said, Randy, where's this tree? You know, was the bee on the flower? And he said, I don't know. And I said, where are your honeybees? Where are your hives from that tree? And he said, about 50 feet away. Well, I think that the bee was just resting. Uh, my brother has a photo of a uh, honeybee actually working a Juneberry. But if you have to look for bees, it is not a significant source of nectar and pollen. Let's just leave it at that. You would never have to look at a BV tree or a seven suns tree or a black locust tree for bees. They're all over it when it's in bloom. So if you've got to look at, at Juneberry or an Amalinker or Shadblow, Shadbush, whatever name you're using, it's not significant. They claim it is in Canada. It certainly is not for us. Amalinker gets cedar apple rust, you bet, it sure does. And I spray a lot of them. And I absolutely refuse to spray crab apples or Juneberries when they're in bloom. And I think that separates me apart from all the other tree care services because I will not spray a tree when it's in bloom with a fungicide or an insecticide. I will drive away with my truck and I will inform the homeowner I'll be back when it's not blooming. So yes, fungicides are a terrible problem with our honeybees. Uh, sourwood, I love sourwood. Thanks for that last question. I grow sourwood. I uh, talked to a guy named Jimmy Gatz in Georgia. He has sourwood growing all around him in Georgia, and they don't get a crop. They have to go north into the higher regions of Georgia to get a crop of, of sourwood honey. I grow sourwood in Michigan. It's covered with blossoms. When the bees hit it, the bees work it hard, um, don't have enough you know, in order to see if the bees will get a crop in Michigan. We, you know, it's a zone five plant. You can grow, it's a zone five. So <laughs> try it. What about fringe trees? Coyanthus, I've, you know, I've never seen bees on it. Um, if you do, great. But again, if you've got a look, then I don't think it's significant. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mike. Greatly appreciate the presentation. Well, good. I hope you learned something. Yes, definitely. And I'll share your the links to your website and your email to our membership once I get this recording up and on our website. Very good, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very All much. All right. Appreciate it. See you guys later, right. I hope. Take care. Bye.